Okay, more technical difficulties as usual. It is now a little bit after 12 and it's Buddha's birthday. This is a holiday, so <clears throat> happy birthday to Buddha and I hope you enjoy your holiday, but we will continue <clears throat> on our journey through this textbook. Uh, this is week eight and this is chapter five. Before we continue, let me remind you that next week you have to do a graded assignment um, where you're supposed to write about an exceptional person. Uh, the information that you need <clears throat> is written in the lecture summary from last week, and it's also written on the website, uh, the due date, May 7th, Thursday, May 7th, uh, 2020. Um, all the guidelines are typed up for you and some recommendations on how to um, write better <clears throat> and to complete um, your paragraph efficiently. I'm going to talk about the process of writing today because <clears throat> writing is a process and that's something that it's a it's a theme that runs throughout the textbook which I completely agree with. It's a painful process as well not just a process but um, if you skip steps inevitably you uh, get punished for it. It doesn't matter if you publish uh, the paper in a <clears throat> world famous world famous newspaper or you're writing a script, uh, you're going to make errors and you're going to miss things if you don't follow this, this rather simple um, method <clears throat> to improve um, the re end result of your writing. And I can promise you, whatever um, grade you would have gotten, that you'll consistently get a higher grade if you listen to what I'm saying. I'm sure most of you will not because <clears throat> we all leave things to the last minute. Uh, as I did tonight, that's why I'm doing my lecture at midnight. So let's um, let's go into the topic this week first, and then at the end of the lecture, I'll give you some <clears throat> more advice on how to approach uh, the writing process for your graded assignment because it is uh, worth more than your other assignments, and it's going to play a role in um, whether you get an A in this class or a B or another grade, okay? So, uh, the topic that the, is introduced in Chapter 5 is called Trends and Fads. And um, I always like to start with, you know, trying to understand better what a certain word means. Uh, one of my professors in university, he used these fancy, this fancy expression, which I s still remember clearly, and I love to use it as well. He said... You can't just use words whenever you want, wherever you want. You have to precisely delineate your terms. Precisely delineate your terms. I hope the, I hope the subtitles catches my pronunciation there. <clears throat> but what that means is you have to um, separate what you're saying from other um, words. There are, there's a distinct and special um, use for every word and that's why there's so many words in English and if you're able to use those words more accurately more precisely um, is what the word he used specifically uh, then you're going to end up with a, <clears throat> a stronger argument in the end uh, and that so that's what's required at a high level of writing especially academic writing is that's what you need to do is precisely delineate your terms okay um, we don't need to go that far because this is composition one, but I'm there. We have goals, obviously, right? Uh, so a trend and a fad are a different thing. A fad is basically a type of trend. It's just a short term um, <clears throat> thing that uh, behavior or <clears throat> fashion or activity or uh, item product that people become interested in. And uh, it becomes visible sometimes you know, it appears everywhere, and then suddenly it's gone again. Uh, I think there's lots of examples that I've... <clears throat> I mean, fashion fashion comes and goes, and it, we don't really call it fashion a, a, a fad, because they, they have, like, um, you know, micro-fashion and, and speed fashion, where something, like, appears for a week, and it disappears. But traditionally, fashions are, you know, some fashions you can look back in time and you can see you basically people are wearing similar things for a whole decade. Or, you know, like there's such thing as like Victorian fashion and stuff. And Victorian, the Victorian era is pretty long. We're talking about, you know, 
Queen Victoria's reign is, uh, you know, more than 50 years. We, she had her diamond jubilee, so you're talking about the better half of a century anyway. But <clears throat> these days, because of um, people's, you know, because of the production, because we can make clothes so fast, and the clothes generally are not as good material as they were in the past. They, they wear out faster, and people replace them because they want to replace them faster. You end up with things that fashion is actually, <clears throat> it's even faster than a fad. A fad is something like, that comes around for, you know, a season, and then it disappears forever. That's how, what I think of it as. <clears throat> um, a good fad is, uh, the example I used to use in Canada is uh, skateboarding. I remember, you know, skateboarding never completely goes away, but it, it had its, tr it was trendy. Um, when I was, before I was young even, there was a, a really famous skateboarder named Tony Hawk. And everybody, everybody knew Tony Hawk, even me, even though I'm not a skateboarder. He's the Michael Jordan of, of um, he, was a, he was the Michael Jordan of skateboarding. He made everybody interested in it. And there was a PlayStation game called, I'm sure you know PlayStation. There was a PlayStation game called Tony Hawk. <clears throat> he created a whole movement around skateboarding, skateboarding fashion, the, the shoes, the jeans, you know, <clears throat> the shirt style, um, the skateboard itself, um, watching skateboard videos, playing skateboard computer games, which I did play a little bit when I was uh, in, you know, going to university. It was a good 20 years ago, I guess, that it was popular. Uh, and that, I would call that a trend at that time, but, you know, when you see a few kids around with skateboards and then suddenly everybody in one middle school is buying a skateboard and then, you know, three weeks later or, you know, by the end of the summer, you, where did all those skateboards go? That's kind of what you would consider a, a, a fad. <clears throat> so uh, a trend has more staying power. And if if a trend endures and like never completely goes away. It comes back in waves. That's possible. But sometimes some, something's not really a trend anymore because it's almost like it's permanent, right? That people, the, it holds the interest so long that people always like it. So, you know, I'm, you're not going to call uh, Beethoven, for example, trendy because Beethoven was a great composer and he was popular when he was you know, composing in the 19th century, early 19th century, and um, 200 years later, everybody knows Beethoven. If I play a Beethoven song, you would recognize it pretty quickly. And I could even just, you know, dun 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 dun, dun 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 dun. Everybody knows that. That's not trendy. That's classic, right? Because that never goes away. Music is a good example of that. Michael Jackson, I think, has entered the, the classic realm now that it's been something like 40 years that his music has remained popular and everybody still loves it. The Beatles would, you know, fit that. And I'm not saying classical, I'm saying classic. So once something becomes popular and trendy and everybody likes it and then it just never goes away and people still have love for it and interest and respect for it, then you get, you get the, the label of, stat, of classic, right? You get the status of classic. Right, <clears throat> so... This is the kind of thing, um, in the picture, I believe, there's multiple versions of this textbook, but my picture has um, piercings. So I'll read this to you really briefly, just for fun, uh, because I have a personal experience with um, this particular fad, and maybe this will make you laugh. <clears throat> um, but this is, this is kind of um, the style of paragraph where you tell a story about yourself, but I want to encourage you, like I am with the exceptional person, not to just summarize about something, but also to reflect on it and make observations so that there, there's, there's a point to it. It's not just, here's my story. Isn't that funny? Um, more like, <clears throat> if you think about it and reflect on it, well, was it a good decision or a bad decision? Were there consequences of it? Why did I think like that? Because, you know, when I was younger, I had a different thought process and I didn't realize that my, you know, tattoo that I put on my back was going to be so difficult to remove and I'd have to, you know, tell everybody why I had a gigantic butterfly on my back for the rest of my life. 
<clears throat> that kind of stuff. So, this is called a special look. My best friend thinks I'm crazy. My father is sure I'll regret my decision. And my mother says I've been tricked by a fashion fad. Right? So this is a temporary thing where people are like, Oh, I really have to have this. i got to have it, Mom, or I'll die. This is a, <clears throat> I like to call it the middle school syndrome, but high schoolers do it too. I, I uh, was pretty obsessed with certain things in high school. <clears throat> However, I'm glad I got multiple piercings in my ears. I got the idea from a photo in a magazine of a top model. That's usually where fads come from. Is it's everybody sees somebody famous do it, and then they copy it. She had a row of diamond studs in each ear, and it looked very elegant. Okay, that's an opinion. I like, I like being able to wear several earrings at the same time. It's a way for me to express my personality. I know that some people don't think that multiple piercings are attractive, but I'm very pleased with this special look. Okay, no justification for it, really, except for... I like this model, and diamonds, <clears throat> diamond studs are cool on her, so I'm just copying her. So it's not really developed in terms of, she's just, maybe she's just being rebellious. Like, I'm just doing it because my mom said no. Maybe that's not the reason. But when you get older, you may realize that some of the things you did, you didn't really need or want, but you insisted on them and did them anyway, because you just wanted... <clears throat> you didn't want your mother to tell you what you did, what to do. I, I did this a lot um, to my mother's chagrin. And uh, I actually did have a piercing in my left ear. And uh, when I was uh, when I was uh, graduating from high school, my brother did it too. <clears throat> um, that's what everybody was doing. My brother was two years younger, and he was in uh, he was still in the middle of high school. And I was graduating, and I went to the shopping mall. And I uh, had the, you know, hair salon lady punch a hole in my ear. It hurt a lot. Put some ice on it, and then I had a stud in there until <clears throat> I went to university, and I actually uh, sort of had an accident, and it, it uh, got torn out of my ear when I was doing some, some activities when I was a freshman. And, and it was too painful to keep in there, so I took it out. And I... I don't regret it. I, I have no desire to have that. But when I when I got it, I thought it was pretty cool. And a lot of other guys had them too, just on the top of the ear. Um, the very next year, none of the seniors had it. It was just my year. Um, it was that year. Not just me, that age, but that year. My brother did it and younger guys did it, but everybody was doing it. Uh, and then a lot of people took them out. I think my brother kept his for a few years, but his is gone too. None of us have them. All I, all I can do is show you the scar uh, to prove that I had an earring. <clears throat> but no desire to have one anymore. She might end up doing the same thing, or may, she may love them forever. But just the impulse to do something and then the tendency to throw it away is what a fad really is. All right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to use a Korean example, you are all freshmen. Um, and some of you are not Korean, you're from other current countries, so you may not have been exposed to um, how trendy Koreans are. But I'm going to say last year there was a fad, not this, uh, sorry, it's, I guess it's two winters ago. It's the winter of 2019, <clears throat> when coronavirus was just a myth, uh, or it was just a preconception. Anyway, <clears throat> um, in 2019, uh, going back two years now, um, every winter usually there is a certain type of coat that uh, most Korean students want to have. And uh, Chungnam students are very trendy. So usually more than 50% of the students have the same coat. So um, people started saying like these things look like kimbap rolls because everybody had a black one. And it's really, they call them long padding. And uh, we don't call them long padding in English in North America. We call that a winter coat. It's not called long padding. But Americans, uh, I mean, Koreans call that, and we can understand what you mean. Americans can get it. But that long padding looks like sort of like you put some keem around you. And um, <clears throat> that's what it was like. At first, it was just a black one. And then everybody started getting um, certain brands, like National Geographic or... Um, Descent, or something like that. But National Geographic is, uh, was probably the most popular brand for a while. And everybody had them. And um, 
what's probably going to happen next winter is even though they could wear those winter coats for five years or ten years, like my winter coat is ten years old, I, I can almost promise you that those coats will disappear and they'll be a different type. Already I started to see white versions of the same thing. There was uh, never any white uh, long padding at first, and then they got suddenly there was these uh, <clears throat> albino ones running around. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that was a micro fad, if you will. So this is what you're doing. When you're talking about class, something that's classic or trendy or a fad uh, or micro something, you're saying how the, it's basically the, the duration of uh, our interest in it is the determining factor. So if it lasts a really long time and never goes away, it's classic. If it's around for a while, it's trendy. If it's here and then gone fairly quickly, then it's a fad. Okay, so that's, um, that's what they're talking about on the, the opening page. Um, the second page is really just a review of vocabulary. All you have to do for that exercise is just, you know, recognize which adjective belongs in which uh, column, and they overlap. There's all kinds of different ones. Convenient, comfortable, fashionable, noisy, optimistic, popular. Some of the things are for only people because they describe personality. Uh, and some are just describing things or places, and you have to decide. Some of them can describe multiple things. A person can actually be salty. I know that sounds strange, but uh, things are salty because we eat food and it's salty or sweet or something else. But a person can be sweet, obviously. Sweet means a nice person. Uh, a salty or bitter person means a person... Salty means... Uh, so the, people use this on the internet all the time. It's a very popular term when somebody is a sore loser or they're, they're angry at somebody's insult. They say, don't be so salty. Don't be salty. Um, that's a little bit of American slang for you. Um, but that's sort of an insult saying you're too sensitive or you're, you just take things too seriously. <clears throat> and a bitter person is somebody that has some pent up anger or emotion in the, they, something went badly for them and they think they didn't deserve it. That's a really good example of how somebody could be bitter, right? Is that they, they uh, just think that they don't deserve something like when you, when you, uh, I don't know, you, let's say you're in a, in a competition and um, you're running a race. We'll say you're running a race and you're winning the race and then, um, you trip and fall over an uneven piece of ground. It shouldn't be there. It's not your fault. Everybody's running, and then there's you know some crack in the in the track or something, and it causes you to stumble and you lose the race. That could cause you to feel bitter because it, you feel like you didn't deserve to lose. That you were winning, and only because there was some sort of accident or bad luck, uh, you didn't win the race. That's the feeling of bitterness. So. Um, that's a good exercise for, like I said, for understanding exactly how to use vocabulary in, in different contexts. The remaining part of the chapter, the next four pages, is really related to this stuff. Um, they talk about f brainstorming and free writing. Now, I didn't put this here, but obviously um, what I, the instructions I gave you from week seven um, about doing the assignment, a, a lot of it is really about how to prepare your ideas. First, you have to choose a person. So you have to brainstorm some ideas and you have to figure out why am I talking about this person? Why am I talking about Barack Obama? Or why am I talking about, I don't know why I said him. Why am I talking about um, FDR? Or why am I talking about Gandhi? Or any number of people. I remember I told you, it, it just has to be a real person. And the person has to be um, famous enough that you can find information uh, in English on them detailed information and you need you must have a reference you need to tell me where you got your information from so I can see um, where you, where you got your facts from and whether you're plagiarizing or whether you're you know referencing information properly um, that's part of <clears throat> being a good writer is um, being able to transform ideas and and recognizing um, and giving proper uh, attributing um, your sources properly, recording and citing your, your sources properly so that everybody can know where they, to verify, it's basically to verify the information. How can I believe what you say is right? 
or that you're writing something original if you don't tell me where it came from. Uh, you're never going to write anything that's just completely from your head. And everybody knows that. So in academic circles, uh, the more sources you have, the better. Because that just means you're more knowledgeable. And if you, um, give, if you source all your material, that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't mean you're copying. It just means you're showing people where you got the information and the ideas from. And you're going to come up with new ways of looking at that material. That's what's going to make your your paper unique, your way of writing it and your, your opinion and your perspective on it. So that's what I need you to do. So you should go through and brainstorm. Just think of a few people. Do you, are you interested in academics? Are you interested in politicians? Or do you like scientists? Or you like entertainers or athletes? It's up to you. It doesn't matter. It can be somebody um, <clears throat> who is, uh, you know, a generous person. You can look for somebody with a certain personality, somebody who did a lot of charity work. There's all kinds of different options. Once you get that idea <clears throat> and you decide why you're writing about that person, then you have to write the one page that I'm asking you to do, double-spaced, 12-point font. You draft it and you look at it when you're done. Hopefully it doesn't take you, it's not too much trouble to put it together, but then you look at it and then you remove stuff that's not, doesn't belong because you've wandered off your topic or, or it's not clear or something like that. So you change sentences that you think aren't really effective and make sure everything's connected and you remove things that don't belong there. And that's what is on page 37 is really you um, fixing things so that everything fits together better. You don't have to like start over again, but you do have to sometimes remove entire sentences or you know if it's something gets if it gets longer you end up moving paragraphs around sometimes i end up doing that but you have to be careful that everything fits together nicely in the co that coherence thing is sometimes an issue it is with me at least okay um so you need to for the paragraph you need to write the topic sentence first and then write supporting sentences and then finish with a concluding sentence and then you need to give your paragraph a title right and then your draft is done. And then you fix it, as I said. And then you look at it over again, finalize it, and print it. Okay? So there should be at least once. Uh, I usually print it off because just having a physical copy helps. Or finish it off, go do something else for an hour. You know it's done, but it, there needs to be, you need to touch it up a little bit, but you need to come back it and kind of disconnect yourself from what you wrote. Come at it fresh, look at it again. Fix it as best as you can. Um, finalize it. Make sure everything's done right. Looks good. Print it again. That's usually how I. And if if you're, uh, you know, if you're working at a higher level, like grad level, or if you're a professor, like I am, um, maybe you print it ten times. And uh, with my book, that was, it was probably more like twenty-five. So <clears throat> once is the minimum. Print. Once is not good enough. Two is the minimum. You need to draft once, and then you need to do a final copy as well. Okay? That's what drafting means, is doing versions of it, doing copies of it. Okay, and on page 41, there's, there's a bunch of checklists. On page 40 and 41, uh, I highly advise you, uh, I highly recommend that you take a look at this checklist and then you try and judge your own writing. This will help you in the editing and finalized section. If you, you edit yourself and then you look at this checklist, okay, did I include a heading? Yes. Did I format the paragraph properly? Yes. Start, to, start, and end, end to, start and end each sentence correctly, that's punctuation. Yes, capitalization, is the, does the paragraph have a title? Did I write a topic sentence? Is there supporting sentences? How many are there? Did I use description? Did I use lots of good adjectives? Uh, does, only, does it only include one clear idea? And does it stay on that clear idea? Are the sentences organized logically? Did I combine the sentences logically? And did I write a concluding sentence? That's a pretty comprehensive list uh, to get you started on trying to make sure that your paper is done correctly. Okay, so that checklist is on page 41. Um, and there, there's another checklist on page 13 that's a little bit more general. And it also gives you a lot of uh, things to look for. Okay, it, I know it says peer reviewing, but since we're social distancing still, 
mostly, although Korea's really opening up. I was outside today and uh, there are people everywhere. So that, but that could quickly change. So if you want to meet your friend and exchange papers uh, as your editing phase, I used to do that in university too. I don't do, usually do that anymore. Instead, uh, I submit my paper and then there is uh, somebody who reviews. There's a peer review process. And if, if they don't like it, then the paper gets rejected. But it, you're lucky because you can, you can just go over it yourself or you can ask a friend and say, hey, you know, we're both taking Professor Sullivan's class. Why don't we just, you look at my paper and I look at yours. Um, one of my friends was a philosophy major and whenever he wrote a paper, I looked at his paper and whenever I wrote mine, um, I was an English major, he was a philosophy major and we just wanted to give some feedback and, and look for things that could be improved. And both of us benefited from that exchange. He, he actually did much better than me as a freshman. But uh, that's probably because my editing skills were so good. And that's the end of the chapter. That's the end of chapter five. So that's it. Enjoy your holiday. And um, please don't wait until the last minute. You have until midnight next Thursday and not a minute later because that's the line. If you hand it in at 11.59, it's not late. And if it's 12.01, it is. Just like Cinderella. Okay? So enjoy your holiday, and I'll talk to you again next week. Have a good night.